Thank you so much for joining me for the 1919 road trip. Um, is everything, uh, Mason, is everything up and, and looking good right now? You're good to go, Hattie. All righty, way to go. Anyways, there's going to be so much to see and so much to do that we'll be lucky to get to that wine tasting party at Rancho de la Cuesta on time. But I promise not to exceed uh, 30 miles per hour limit because I don't want to end up in speeders court like so many others have lately. But I will be playing rather loose with time, um, bouncing back and forth between 1913 and 1923. By the way, one of our party, Mary Louise Days, the former city historian, informs me that today is California Statehood Day. We are 69 years old in 1919. There couldn't be a better day to see a piece of our beautiful state. Just think, in 2020, it will be the 170th anniversary of California statehood. So here we are. Before we can leave town, however, we need to head over to the central garage where Vincent E. Wood, grandfather to William Wood, also known as Willie, um, has his Buick dealership. And uh, Willie was kind enough to lend me this photograph. Um, that's Willie's grandfather right there, uh, standing next to the model 2146 coupe, which raced the Southern Pacific Rail uh, train from San Francisco to Portland and won. You can see the roads were mostly dirt and the Buick has a lovely coating of that on it. This was a great uh, advertising gimmick for Buick. My new Buick car has just arrived and uh, this is what we'll be taking. It's the one in the center and it's completely ready for the open road. Since I'm playing fast and loose with time, I've or pro uh, ordered the extremely popular 1923 five passenger sport touring car. It has a red interior and I think we're gonna look really nice driving down the coast in it. So hop on in. Be sure you have your Kodak with you because there's lots to see along the way. We'll be traveling to the finally completed section of Route 2 through Santa Barbara County. It's the dark black line that you see on the map and was built by the State Highway Commission and the County of Santa Barbara. It's called Route 2 because it's the second state highway built in California and it stretches from the Mexican border to San Francisco. It's a real improvement in roads. It's 16 feet wide and made of concrete. The county had to pass a bond election to build the bridges along the way, but the state took responsibility for building the two largest ones. Uh, the county also required all the landowners along the way to fence their lands because of course, livestock wandering along that little stretch of highway would not be too safe for us autoists or for them. Part of the reason it took so long to build may have been this little matter of having to enter World War I, which we called the European War, and also then having the, uh, afterwards, having an invasion of the Spanish flu, a worldwide pandemic. And though they'll later find it didn't originate in Spain, and in 2020, we won't refer to it as such, it nevertheless had a devastating effect on us, and we are so relieved to finally be on that road again. Before this time, I would never have attempted this trip with y'all. The old road was dirt, swung into each and every ravine and canyon and crossed creeks uh, um, all along the way. This 19, uh, 1898 map is a railroad planing map and the red line you see on it is the line of the planned railroad. And the white continuous line that you see is the road that, as it was as a dirt road going in and out of every single canyon. To get an idea of what that must have looked like, I'm going to show you this photograph of Arroyo Hondo Canyon at the time that they're building the railroad and the trestles that went across each of these ravines. If you look over on the left, see my cursor flipping around here, there's the old road and it goes all the way down off this picture and then comes right back up again 
and you can see the dirt road right here, which is the vantage point of right the lower part of the photograph, the vantage point from which this photograph is taken. Okay, that is enough preamble. Let's hit the road. Since State Street ends at Constance, we need to get over to De La Vina, and which will become Hollister Avenue right around Mission or Alamar. From there, we go all the way through. Um, and we will cruise past farms and rural countryside, a few stores at Goleta, uh, before we head to the little town of Naples. The tiny town of Naples was founded in 1887 by Alice and John Williams, who had purchased a portion of Rancho dos Pueblos and subdivided the lands into residential plots. You can see on the map, and again, you can find my cursor here. This is the old road, okay? In fact, it, and it crosses here, it crosses Dos Pueblos Creek and then goes on out. You can see it's a small town. There are very few buildings in it, and there are lots of plots of land and prop only one building. And this would be in 1898 by now. Um, they had counted, the Williams had counted on the railroad coming through to bring residents to the community and tourists to a grand hotel that they planned to build. The rail line, however, ended at Elwood uh, in 1887, and their, sto uh, their story, the story of the town is absolutely fascinating, and I urge you to access Tom Madumio's article at galitahistory.com for a full account of it. But the town and its lands were sold this year and the new owner has tried to absorb them back into Rancho dos Pueblos. We are cross crossing the creek, dos Pueblos Creek right here, where the county has built a steel truss bridge. It was completed in 1915 and still carries traffic today, but now this is a private road. The next ranch along the way is called uh, Rancho Cañada de Corral. Before the new highway, the road, once again, you can see how it wiggled all over the place, crossing creeks, coming all the way out to El Capitan Point, and then staying closer to the highway. A lot of that road in this part being to the uh, ocean side of the railroad tracks, which once again, this is the railroad. Anyway, um, the rancho was a Mexican era land grant given to the grandson of Jose Francisco Ortega. Ortega was the first commander of the Santa Barbara Presidio and he was the owner of the only Spanish land grant in Santa Barbara County, um, Nuestra Señora del Refugio. Jose Dolores Ortega named one of the canyons on his ranch for his grandfather and the Ranch was later acquired by the Hazard, Roland Hazard family of Mission Canyon. Now the Hazards, you know them, you know Roland. Roland built the stone bridge and walls in the, in the canyon, two houses there as well, Dial House being one of them. I believe two religious, religious communities owned them in 2020. His daughter, Carolyn Hazard, is responsible for the construction of the Museum of Natural History. A lot of Santa Barbans owned property out on the Gaviota coast. The road we're on, this is the new road. And I'm looking for my cursor, okay. Look on the right down here. This road, this is the road that we're on now. This is the new road. This is the 1918 highway. And you can see how it eliminates all of those uh, all of those dips into the canyons and is north of the railroad tracks. Much smoother sailing, it's all concrete. We're going to crash a party, however, so we have to come back down here to El Capitan Point, which is right here at this point. Um, we're crashing a party of being given by the Pelican Club, which is an exclusive social club of four to eight members. 
Uh, it was founded in Santa Barbara, and we believe that it was named for Larco's famous white pelican that hangs out at his fish market on Lower State Street. This year, the men have invited the club has invited 100 men to, to a barbecue underneath the oaks and sycamores by the beach of El Capitan. This well-watered feast includes lo lobster salad, barbecued chicken, spaghetti, baked beans, and that old California delicacy, two bull's heads, uh, roasted in a pit of white hot rocks and covered over with earth. A combo led by Paul Whiteman, band leader of the Ambassador Hotel, which was originally the Potter Hotel, um, is playing jazz from the back of a flatbed truck. Many of the guests are jiving to the tunes. After all, it's been a well-watered event up to this point. The all-male event has put up with our inv invasion fairly well, but they have uncovered those bull's heads and are now arguing about who gets to eat the eyes. And I think it's time for us to scurry back to our cars and head on out. Paul Whiteman, by the way, would become known as the King of Jazz and was quite famous once uh, he left Santa Barbara. In 20, uh, okay, the ocean side of the road will become in 2020, by 2020, a, a state, lovely state park and campground. Um, but in the canyon, an auto camp will continue to evolve. And this is the photo shows uh, one of the earliest incarnations of this auto camp. Oh, and I want to go back one. The white pelican that you see there is actually a photo of the white pelican that lived at the base of State Street at Larco's Fish Market. Okay. Today, in 2020, the canyon will be completely developed and prices will range from $180 for a glamping experience with no bathroom to $795 for a two bedroom cabin, and that's per night. Well, that's too rich for my pocketbook, so we'll continue up the new highway to cross the new concrete bridge at Cañada del Corral. As you can see, many of these concrete bridges were just very simple bridges uh, because they didn't need to span such a huge gap. Taking another look at the map, you see we're approaching Refugio Canyon. The dirt road over the mountain, which they started talking about in 1889, was finally, made re was finally realized in 1898. It was built so travelers could avoid the steep, treacherous turns and the toll fines for using the San Marcos Pass. Um, it will eventually be paved and remain open for years until Ronald Reagan becomes president and the pass is closed forever. And here's the new concrete bridge across Refugio Creek with the culvert for the train tracks on the left. This canyon was the original home of Jose, Capitan Jose Francisco Ortega. In, 20, in 2020, it's a lovely state campground. It's hard to believe, however, that at one point in time, it was a spot, hot spot for smuggling during Spanish days. One English trading ship was conducting business in the Bay in 1812 when an earthquake rocked the coast and sent a tidal wave that carried the ship up the canyon past the Ortega's adobe. Uh, the receding waters carried it back into the bay, and as the story supposedly goes, trading resumed. Um, this being 1919, uh, this, this next year, the bay will once again become a hot spot for smuggling, but this time for illegal hooch. The road takes us past the Tahiguas Ranch, where we've been invited to come up for a mid-morning snack. Um, Clifford H. Clifford Moore is offering us his famous corn biscuits drenched in wild honey raised from honey from bees raised on the ranch and lemonade made from lemons from their grove. The photo shows a truck carrying what to me is a mysterious piece of equipment uh, in front of the Tahigua store and the berries that you see on the right are, tahi are tar 
Tahiyas, also known as Isle, uh, which grow in the canyon and were used by the Chumash, who used to have a village down there. This is another ranch that was once owned by the Ortega family. It was sold to Amasa Lincoln and the Young Brothers in the 1870s. Um, Abby Lincoln uh, remembers that they lived in the old Ortega adobe, which you see is the part of the house on the left. And she remembers that Pacifico Ortega gave her a housewarming gift of a flock of chickens and a rooster. One of the chickens took a real shine to Abby and presented her every morning with a fresh egg on Abby's bed. Uh, Abby found this a little too familiar, and the Lincolns didn't really last very long out here as ranchers, uh, but they moved back to town to open what is today the Upham Hotel. On the left is the adobe section of the much expanded house. Lawrence Moore's son, H. Clifford, owns it in 1919, but it will soon be sold to the Kirk Johnsons, who will try to preserve it, find it's not possible, so they will tear it down and build a new adobe house, one designed by George Washington Smith. Years later, we will see some interesting people living in this canyon, including a commune, the Brotherhood of the Sun. As time goes on, gas stations will be added to the store and the concrete road will be coated with asphalt. Uh, there is also a train stop at Tehiwas, and we can rent cabins near the store, but since we're not ready to settle down for the night, we're gonna continue on our, our trip. As I said earlier, before 1919, the road passed Arroyo Hondo, dipped into the canyon, crossed the creek, on a wooden bridge, climbed out the other side. Jenny Hollister, daughter of the Colonel, had purchased the ranch from the Ortega family in 1909. The railroad planning map shows the old dirt road and indicates the buildings that existed around 1898. And if you've ever been there, you'll see that there are fewer buildings today than there were then. Arroyo Hondo, was once a stage stop and also served as a camp for the railroad crews. It was the unfinished bridge at Arroyo Hondo that was a stumbling block to travel on the new coast highway. Its completion, therefore, inspired a large headline. And the article says, although no ceremonies were carried out, an unusually large crowd visited the huge cement structure during the day, many photographs being taken. In fact, the Kodak Battalion was up on the spot early and as the bridge is one of the most pretentious in Southern California, it is quite likely that the synapse will be sent far and wide. And indeed they were. Let's join that Kodak Battalion and stop for a few photos, perhaps from the vantage point of the original road as the man at the far right seems to be doing. You can see that there is a car already traveling on the road. You can see it there on the left. And um, you can see the pretentious arches, apparently, according to the person who wrote the article. It's actually a very beautiful bridge. And then it's right next to the trestle. From this vantage point, we can see four areas of transportation along the Gaviota coast. Obviously, there's the ocean, and there was originally just shipping. It was the easiest way to get anywhere. Then we had a road, but it was a dirt road, and it carried mostly horses and horse-drawn traffic. Then we had the train, 1901, that train track was uh, fully completed. And then finally, a concrete bridge to take modern automobile traffic. And let's take one more snapshot. If we were to visit this place in 2020, this is what it would look like. The bridge has been decommissioned, but you can go visit it from a viewpoint um, and walk on it and stand right next to that 
train trestle as well. There's some very steep and scary and unrecommended steps that would take you down to the beach. The modern highway in 2020 avoids this. That's my husband standing at the end of the bridge. You can see what has happened. Mother Nature has taken over the highway. And to the left, you can see the huge berm that was built to carry the four lanes of highway. A berm created a problem, however. Uh, JJ, the first thing was that J.J. Hollister claims that his father told the Highway Commission that, well, yeah, you could build a culvert to drain my creek, but it better be high enough for me to ride my horse wearing my Stetson so I can herd my cattle along the beach to new pasturage. Well, that worked fine, but it wasn't enough for the steelhead trout to come back to the canyon. So when the Land, tr the trust, land trust for Santa Barbara County uh, acquired the property, uh, they got together with a, with J.J. Uh, Hollister and a consortium of other groups and they built a fish ladder to carry the fish back to the canyon. And this is it, the fish canyon. It's been very, very successful. And today the Arroyo Hondo Preserve is a real jewel of the Gaviota Coast. I urge you to uh, to take a look at it sometime. Uh, you can go there. Uh, you need to get on their website and find out the rules and regulations and, and how to do the, go about doing that. It's absolutely magical. Okay, on we go. Um, now that we stretched our legs a bit, we'll move on to Alcatraz and Gaviota. Once again, the map shows the old road with its twists and turns. The Alcatraz Asphalton Company established a refinery and a port here in uh, 1896. They laid two 35 mile long twin pipes from the Asphalton mines in Sisquoc to and after liquefying that Asphaltum with the naphtha would send it through one of those pipes to the Alcatraz refinery. There, the naphtha would be removed and sent back to Sisquoc through the other pipe. Um, at the refinery, uh, the line with all the numbers on it that you see, that is the line of the pipeline and it had to go through the Gaviota Gorge. Alcatraz developed into a town as well as a refinery. There were a school, there were houses for workers, a hall, a post office, and a store uh, as, along with the wharf that was created there. And you can see the photo on the left at the bottom shows the children of the school playing on their playground. I can't even imagine the kind of pollution that they had to play in. Alcatraz was actually had quite a bit of society, as did its neighbor Gaviota. They even had a seven member symphony orchestra and a 20 member cornet band. News from Alcatraz is published in the morning press nowadays. These two articles talk about a program for the close of school for the summer, the enthusiastic tennis players on their courts, and a tour of the oil tanker chancellor, which also sometimes um, host moonlight parties. No moonlight party tonight, so uh, we are probably going to head on out by 1927. The Alcatraz School, the Araya School, and the Las Cruces Schools will have been merged to form Vista Del Mar. Most of you would recognize this from traveling up and down that highway. Um, in 2020, this will lie shuttered due to the pollution uh, that is from the also shuttered refinery that was built next door. In 2020, the site of Alcatraz is being remediated with future recreational uses in mind. It will be wonderful to have another spot open to the public along this beautiful coast. Just before the turn to Gaviota, we pass the Gaviota train station where farmers and ranchers have been bringing their goods and livestock for shipping since 1901. Across the highway, uh, the Gaviota store is a social center for area residents. 
uh, as well as travelers. It includes a dance hall and sometimes has live entertainment. There's a telephone exchange, there's gasoline for sale. The walls are papered with wanted posters and the restaurant is already famous for its hamburgers, stew and chili. Eventually, there will be 10 auto courts here, but we're not ready to stop. At some time in the future, the Gaviota stores uh, will disappear, uh, probably due to high, uh, highway widening. Uh, but in the 1970s, a new center for Gaviotans and travelers was built by the Brotherhood of the Sun. It was called the Farmer and the Fisherman, and many of you may remember it. Besides organic goods from Sunburst Farms, music was once again given to the community. Eventually, that restaurant burned to the ground as well, will burn to the ground as well, and the gas station ceased to function and be removed. By 2020, all that will remain are the foundations of the building and the remnants of the old highway. This is the old highway looking west, and this is the old highway looking east, looking back at the old refinery. You can still, you can even see it in the background. And so we arrive at Gaviota, which has recently closed its refinery, though it continues to be a port for oil and gas. This village has an interesting history. The landing at Gaviota had been used by farmers and ranchers from the interior for many years before Colonel William Wells Hollister built a 1,000 foot wharf in 1875. Uh, he did that to facilitate trade and transportation. Miguel Burke, who was the son of a Scottish mariner, lived in an adobe house near the landing. And he farmed the land, raised sheep, cattle, and horses. He ran the gas station, excuse me, the stage station, the inn, the post office, and the store that grew up in the area. This very old photograph shows the farm complex and the origin and the dis in the distance. If you'll look out at the landing, you can see where my cursor is. That is a masted schooner. We'd have no idea how old this is, but I think it's pre 1875. In the 1970s or 80s, the brush from the area will is going to be removed, and um, the foundations of that whole complex will be revealed. What happened to this area afterwards, I have no idea. But the brush is definitely back. Ranchers from San Julian and other areas will continue to use Gavio to ship their cattle as this photo from the 1930s or 40s shows. You can compare this photo to a similar view on the right. If you look at this green grassy hill right there, that is this green grassy hill right here. So it, we're basically cutting it off and it's a slightly different angle. But you can see how much the terrain has changed and how much it has grown up when you look at this picture of basically a wash with the cattle now being driven across it. Sharing the pa Gaviota Pass with auto traffic uh, could be treacherous. And even before the new highway was begun in 1913, a man named Jacob Lustelot of Las uh, Cruces was herding his sheep through the pass when a very impatient motorist tried to kind of push his cattle, out, his sheep out of the way. Uh, Lustelot solved the problem by roping the man and tying him to his steering wheel until the sheep were safely off the road. The Hollisters and others continue to use the ranch house at Gaviota as a stopover when driving their cattle through the pass for shipment by rail. Dibley Poet, owner of Rancho San Julian, told me that nowadays they usually leave the ranch in the early morning and arrive at Las Cruces around noon where they water and rest the cattle before pushing on through the pass. There are usually four or five vaqueros riding ahead wearing red scarves, red bandanas, 
And um, their job is to warn motorists of, of, uh, who are coming up the pass to pull off the road and allow the, the herd to continue. In the late 1920s to the 1946, the California Highway Patrol will take this over and to help the cattle drive and warn the drivers. Okay, let's pause for a really quick break and some refreshment along the side of the road here. And be sure you can use the auto cushions as really wonderful, comfortable seating. Oh, and I see that some of you have brought libations with you. Looks like a good place to take a rest while I give you an itinerary update. We are right here, just outside Gaviota. Look where my cursor is, find Gaviota. We're going through the gorge right here. Then we're going to go to Las Cruces. Then we're going to go up the pass to what is called Gaviota Pass, down the Hnawi grade, then along the brand new highway um, and stopping to see some of the bridges along the way until we get to the first bridge across the San Ynez River and Rancho de la Cuesta. Okay, so I bet you're ready to move on now. Here we go. The gorge, uh, the new concrete bridge through the Gaviota Gorge with its famous old man rock, which you can see right here on the left, uh, is a great place to stop for a quick photo opportunity. The gorge was once an idyllic canyon, a favorite spot for artists like Henry Chapman Ford, uh, Santa Barbara's first resident artist. Then in 1880, uh, the part, this part of the route, however, excuse me, this part of the route, however, was the, one of the great stumbling blocks for wagon and stage traffic. As you can see, the buggies and the stages and the horses have to actually enter the creek to get through this area. And once again, if you look up on the left, there is Old Man. Then in 1887, the county built a bridge. Uh, it's 16 foot wide iron bridge and it overlooked, again, old man overlooks it. You can see how idyllic and beautiful the canyon is below that bridge, but the uh, ambiance is a little marred by the construction. Sometimes there was lots of traffic on this bridge as this made it so much easier to negotiate the road to Gaviota. And here's one last Kodak moment for the new bridge and the old man. Eventually, the highway will need to carry two lanes in each direction, at which time a tunnel will be bored. And some of you may remember this particular configuration because it's changed yet again today excuse me, in 2020. From there, the highway brings us to Las Cruces, a small town built at the junction of the San Julian Road, today's Highway 1, or 2020's Highway 1, and Route 2, Highway 101. It has a rich history dating back to Chumash and Mexican times. That history is excellently documented on uh, the Cordero family website. The 1909 bridge, which you see in the foreground on the left, uh, is what brings us to this very popular stop on the road north. Once a stagecoach stop, the town now caters to Ottawa's with an inn. And you can see the bridge down below uh, that still exists, that will exist in 2020 and can be visited. In 1919, however, a lunchroom, a general store, and gas stations offer uh, lots of amenities for the, for the Ottawa's that go through. It's, I'm going to stop for a second because two 
uh, my friends wrote me about this. One is Marjorie who lived in uh, Las Cruces and remembers uh, much of this, m many of the people that live there and uh, the, that the general's grocery store, the merchandise store was once old, owned by Say Sarana uh, loosed a lot. And then Mary Louise Day's uh, uh, grandparents and aunt and uncle lived in Las Cruces and her grandparents lived uh, on a ranch in outside of Solvang. So um, these, these areas are, are really special to both of them and they have lots of wonderful stories uh, and I hope to uh, do a little bit more on Las Cruces the next time we're through. This is uh, where Jacob loosed a lot. It's the old Cadero home, uh, used to sleep, uh, live. And you can see uh, this is in 1940 and you can see the condition that it's in. This is it today. And although it's part of the state park, it has been, uh, they attempt to preserve it. They've built a big metal roof over this, but this is the condition and uh, they keep hoping to find the money to preserve it. It's really a special place and should be preserved. It's a wonderful place for a picnic, even if the picnic tables are a little bit dilapidated. And you can see from the sign, which is also dilapidated, more dilapidated now than you're seeing on there, uh, what it must have looked like way back when. Okay, we have come across an old friend, Arlo Atchison. He is a race car driver and master mechanic. Um, he is in love with this Buick and he is outside taking a photo of it. Arlo is known for that and has filled a photo album filled with his beloved car. And the signs that you see here tells the distance to Las Cruces. And these signs were put together and uh, placed throughout the county by the Automobile Club. The 2020 satellite map of Highway 1 reveals the remaining slivers of the 1918 highway with its concrete surface and bridges. And you can see them, everything that kind of snakes outside of the main uh, Highway 101 is really part of the old highway. The area in red reveals this bridge, which we would be using, are using to travel across in this part of the road, which in 2020 is returning to nature, but we are traveling along speedingly. Finally, we reach the summit of Gaviota Pass and start down the Naui grade. We'll stop for a few photos there. This section of the road will still exist in 2020 and be open to traffic. You can see you can see where the asphalt has been worn away to reveal the original concrete. And this is at the top of the road just after turning off the 101. The view from halfway down shows the road goes through farmland, uh, mostly owned by organic farmers and their produce stands. Farther along the road can be seen crisscrossing the new highway, revealing the reason it was abandoned. It was way too curvy. We are next going, okay. No, here, we're gonna find the old road again right here and it's really a pretty amazing spot. The bridge is still there and it's a beautiful, strong and large expanse. It's really an interesting bridge. There are 18 bridges that were built by the county but this is one of the larger ones. In 2020, the old road beyond this bridge is littered and ab with abandoned motor vehicles of another era. Uh, this is my friend Gail Kvistat. Uh, she accompanied me one day on my search for the old road and the remnants thereof. Uh, she is the host of Living Local and a former English student of mine at La and during La Colina days. And we just couldn't resist taking a few more pictures of the old equipment and the colorful array of uh, these cement mixers. Farther along the old road has become a slab foundation for a couple of buildings. 
and if you were to go, but we are using this. We're going straight on this old road, crossing over to where you see these cypress. And that means we would be crossing the modern Highway 101. This postcard is of the first bridge across the San Inez River at this point. Each end is connected by an earthen berm. This is only the third bridge across the, the San Inez River and it's facilitating the transformation of the headquarters of the Buell Ranch into the town of Buellton. In 2020, and we can see the remains of that bridge. All of the ironwork is gone, but we can see the remains of this bridge if we stand on the 1948 bridge and look in that direction. The old approach to the 1916 bridge is uh, you can walk there today and you can actually get on top the piece that's still in existence and it's through this beautiful allay of pepper trees and it, it ends pretty close to where I've taken this picture and my husband is looking to the left at the bridges from the uh, current Highway 101. So we are going back to Rancho de la Cuesta. This ranch was established by Dr. Ramon de la Cuesta in 1853 for his bride, Micaela Coda, uh, when he purchased 8,000 acres of Rancho La Vega. In 1853, he built a 13 room adobe for their growing family, which you see here and is on the National Register of Historic Places. The, um, De La Cuesta family would become involved in so many civic and business affairs of the community as that, and they became very, very prominent. This is the De La Cuesta Adobe around 1933, 1933. Alexander Harmer, the artist who had buried into one of Santa Barbara's Spanish families, had in the 1890s had made his next, his life's work retelling the stories in a visual way of their history. And this is his story that he shows of Rancho de la Cuesta. And what you see underneath the grape arbor is Micaela Coda dealing Monty. You can see all of the men gathered around her in very colorful costumes. Uh, uh, betting on the game and this particular man is reaching in for more money to put on the table. You can see the guests arriving, some of them looking quite humble like this couple. This is supposed to be Felicidad Adabi who is um, Alexander Harmer's wife. In the background you can see the dust up of the corral of horses. On the right here you see a careta and you see two women sitting and gossiping. And my favorite part, because it reminds me of a Hieronymus Bosch painting, are these two boys who are sampling the Arguardiente, which is Mexican brandy or Spanish brandy and uh, not finding it to their liking, they're spitting it at the dog. Dr. Ramon de la Cuesta died in 1887, but his son Eduardo has taken over the ranch and his father's position in the community. He has served as county supervisor and was involved with the San Inez Land Company. Uh, the de la Cuesta family is waiting to greet us here in front of their adobe home. Eduardo was thrilled that the road is finally complete as he's been lobbying for these improvements for many, many years. In fact, in 1911, he went before the Board of Supervisors to demand a grand jury investigation regarding the superintendent of some recent road work. And this is what he had to say. He's built a road that's so steep at the river crossing that I take a chance ki killing myself and my family every time I try to drive it in a spring wagon. 
Well, the newspaper reported that when De, Cuesta, De La Cuesta warmed thoroughly to his subject, he opened fire on the road boss, Conover, and his entire road workforce, even the mules. This is what he said. The road foreman spends more of his time sitting with his back to a tree, smoking a pipe, and for days at a time, the mules do no harder work than chew hay and munch grain. Uh, today, he is clearly pleased with the improvements in transportation and the magnificent bridge, which has been built at Cuesta Crossing. The family have invited us out to the vineyard and wonder if we have made the crossing through the Gaviota Gorge safely. They will never forget returning by car from Gaviota in 1913 and having just passed the old iron bridge at the Gaviota Gorge when two armed men stepped up from the roadside and demanded that they hold up their hands. They definitely wanted to comply, but their chauffeur had trouble controlling the car and raising his hands at the same time. And somehow he managed it and he and his passengers uh, got out of the automobile with their hands over their heads. They expect it to be searched. And Eduardo, Eduardo de la Cuesta told the man, he said, uh, you know, we, I am Eduardo de la Cuesta. Oh, said one of the men, you are de la Cuesta, are you? Well, we don't want you, you can go along. So they obeyed without further word, but it turned out that these armed men were deputies lying in wait for a stolen automobile that was supposed to be heading north along uh, from Santa Barbara. So our journey is now at its end and we are going to enjoy the famous De La Cuesta hospitality as we taste the fruit. Oh, and I get my own wine. I'm so excited. Thank you. As, as, as we taste the fruit of their vines and the historic ambiance of their beautiful rancho. The rancho still exists in, in um, and is a winery today. So let's raise a glass and toast the past. <laughs>